Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. So I've recently changed uh, jobs. I was uh, running the DevRel team at Ambassador Labs up until a few weeks ago, so I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but more importantly today, what I'd like everyone to walk away from this talk uh, is that choosing or migrating to an API gateway, particularly in the cloud, I'm going to talk about sort of Kubernetes a little bit, uh, is a type one decision. I'll cover that in a moment, but it's a complicated decision. Traffic management is a key part of any platform you're building. And we're all deploying software on platforms, right? Whether you know it or not, it's like architecture. Whether you know it or not, you've got it. You've got one. Platforms, architecture, same deal. I'm going to say treat an API gateway as a product. This is becoming more of a thing with platforms in general. Think about developer. Operator experience, Sven mentioned that. It's very much one of my passions, thinking about DevEx. And also, I'm going to recommend focusing on the workflows and the tooling interoperability and the integrations in particular. Uh, this is where my you know, 20 years almost career, uh, where I've used API Gateways a heck of a lot, this is where uh, it's bitten me the most. Fantastic introduction. Thank you, Sven. I don't really need to go through this, right? But I'm at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs, GitHub, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, I've uh, written for InfoQ. Uh, my background is a Java developer, and I moved into ops, and I moved into um, architecture as well. And more recently, doing a lot of uh, product work in the API gateway space, and also DevRel, uh, developer relations at Ambassador Labs. But because it was a startup, I literally did everything from sales to customer support. So I was working with some amazing folks building platforms, installing API gateways, and I learned a bunch of stuff. I have actually got a couple of books with me, Mastering API Architecture, my buddies Jim and Matt. So good questions, get a book. I've only got three with me today, but at the end, if you ask a question, I will give you a book. Owning my bias, I do contribute to the MSRE Ingress CNCF project, which is an open source API gateway, and there is a commercial product on top, the Ambassador Edge Stack. Again, I don't work for Ambassador Labs anymore, but just know that I, you know, I'm going to use those as examples because I've used them a heck of a lot recently. So, start off, decisions, decisions, decisions. As with many choices in software development, everything, every good question can be answered with it depends. Right? Should I do that? It depends. The most critical thing is figuring out what it depends on. I do like this Jeff Bezos quote, and Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, brought some of these things together. But to be honest, many folks have been talking about this for many years. But he talks a lot about some decisions are consequential and irreversible, or nearly irreversible. You need to be very careful with these decisions. Great deliberation, consultation. We call these type one decisions, right? And whatever you think of Jeff Bezos, like, I just think it's a nice sort of like bringing together of like a concept. Type one decisions are really valuable, but you've got to spend a lot of time up front thinking about them, getting them right. There's a whole bunch of other decisions which are type two decisions. These are the ones that, you know, day in, day out, you can roll in, you can roll out. Um, you haven't got to worry so much about those. It's more about um, making uh, quick decisions with high judgment, individuals or small groups. And if you're at this conference, you are a very much a high judgment individual. In fact, your self-selecting coming to a go-to means you're a high, um, a high judgment individual. You can make these kind of type two decisions day in, day out. I'm going to argue that an API gateway, either choosing one or migrating to one in the cloud, is a type one decision, right? API gateways are difficult to change and replace. I've worked on a number of projects where we've tried to upgrade gateways, replace them, change them. It's a sticky technology, right? It's very sticky. It has a steep learning curve. And once people have invested time to learn, they're reluctant to let that knowledge go. The API Gateway is on the business-critical hot path for practically all traffic. So changing it requires some kind of migration plan, right? Because you can't just suddenly turn traffic off and turn it on somewhere else, or not very easily. All requests flow through this component, high-value component. you really got to think about that migration plan if you do want to swap out an API Gateway. And lastly, they can be expensive, right? Contract lock-in is real. I saw this a lot when I was at Ambassador Labs doing sales. A lot of folks have been sold very expensive 
API management contracts, and they just couldn't afford to walk away from those contracts until six months' time or you know, a year's time. So this is, this is really important. Um, platform engineers definitely need to consider the euro, right, the, the money. And even more in this non-zero interest rate phenomena, as they call it, like the, the environment we're in now, money really matters. I'm seeing this a lot when I was on the sales cycles. People are doing extra due diligence. They're thinking more about, can I afford this thing? Um, we as platform engineers need to really um, think about the costs associated with any decision. So an API gateway is what I consider a type one decision, right? Now, I've talked here, we as platform engineers need to consider you know, what we're doing here. I haven't really introduced the platform engineering concept, so let me just quickly dive in. I did a talk at KubeCon in Valencia last year. It was quite well received. It was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, and I talked about from Kubernetes to PaaS to uh, what's next. I worked on a bunch of PaaSes. I built some PaaSes. I worked on a lot of Kubernetes platforms. And I was sort of thinking, like, what, what's next, right? And I argued that, um, well, I'll, I'll go through in a minute, but you need to think about the, the control planes and how you interact with, with the platforms more than anything. If you do want to check out that, oh, that talk, um, you can find it on uh, YouTube, on the CNCF channel there. Um, it goes into more detail. I'll do a whistle-stop tour now, just for like to set platform engineering up, um, uh, just as a refresher. But a much more content, 40 minutes of content, is on uh, YouTube. So like I said, I built a number of platforms, uh, some on Mesos, on Apache Mesos, a bunch on Kubernetes, and I work with a lot of companies in particular using Kubernetes now. Uh, I made some mistakes, uh, I had some wins with my teams, um, and I learned a bunch of things. And I think the next thing from platform as a service is going to be what we're calling golden paths. Right, and it's so Spotify coined the term, but I, I don't think we can really create a perfect platform as a service for the complexity we now inherit. Serverless, Kubernetes, cloud. I think having one solution to rule them all is not really a thing. So golden paths are the way forward. So paved roads, paved paths, paved platforms. The real questions we need to ask ourselves, how much are we going to build? How much this platform should we build ourselves? And how do we assemble the control plane, as in the, the piece of the puzzle that we interact with as developers day in, day out? Um, and how do we assemble that control plane for effective use? Platform engineering is pretty much the discipline of doing this, right? Building these golden paths, these platforms, um, figuring out how, what to buy, what to build, and how to assemble the interaction components, the control plane, how we use these things day in, day out. I riff back on in my, that talk on my 20-year um, career in, in engineering. Right? So I started as a Java developer doing a lot of um, you know, classic J2E stuff in the day, right? And then I moved into doing some um, uh, platforms as a service work, Cloud Foundry, Heroku. And you can see the cognitive load as the years tick by, my cognitive load you know, went up a little bit when I started doing um, sort of bigger projects involving message queues and ESBs and gateways. And then when I was doing like Heroku stuff, it was actually quite easy to understand. Heroku had clearly been designed as a product, had a nice interface, I could push my code super easy, nice UI, same when New Relic for the dashboards. Like, it was built and designed as a product. I really liked that. You know, I love microservices, for sure. A lot of like, value, sort of service-oriented architecture, take two, right? But there was inherent complexity of all the things I had to learn as an engineer during that time when microservices in cloud really like, blew up. Um, we kind of lost sight of developer experience, I think. You know, I was doing Terraform and Bash and, and you know, all these other things and knitting them all together. And I, you know, love, love that kind of stuff, right? But many of the companies I was working with as a consultant at the time um, did not enjoy learning all these things. They, they wanted a simpler developer experience, right? You'll also notice that during my career, I felt that I was mainly focused on the code earlier on, but then I moved into thinking about shipping and running. Not a bad thing. You build it, you run it, all that kind of stuff, right? But it meant my cognitive load, again, was getting increasingly higher. We've got this code, this ship and this run. I think we can all probably agree on the various sort of components within a, you know, a platform that we've either built or we've inherited. But how that question mark there, how do we interact with the platform? That's the key thing, right? And this is where a lot of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, a lot of um, you know, foundations are emerging, the um, 
Cloud Foundry Foundation, that kind of thing. Um, and the CNCF in particular has got a whole bunch of projects for each of the code, the ship, and the run that you can assemble together. But the critical thing is, how do you integrate them all? So you can see, like, you know, Backstage, I'm sure there's going to be some talks on Backstage here. Uh, backstage is really popular as a kind of UI framework for knitting together your platform, for service catalog, for bootstrapping apps. Uh, but then you want to think about things like webhooks, CRDs, APIs for integrating all the things. And today, we're mainly going to look at the API space there on, like, on the run. But like, there's just a lot of complexity with these things, right? I love building platforms, but a word of caution, like, so there is a lot more complexity. And I got trolled by Dan North. I'm sure many of you know um, Dan North, right? He's awesome. He's a friend of mine, so I was good trolling. But I put this um, tweet up last week saying, you know, I literally, I opened my email, checked Twitter, and I'd seen 10 Kubernetes-based platforms already, right? Um, they are thinking more about end-to-end -end value these days, which is good, but I think it's a really interesting space for this year. Like, if you're building a platform, there's many folks you can buy things from, uh, and you can build your own as well, right? But Dan came back, right? My, you know, came back and said, I'll say it again, Kubernetes is just J2EE for the cloud generation. Over-engineered, overly complex for 99% of use cases, but ubiquitous and mandated as a solution before we've even looked at the problem. It's like, ouch, Dan. <laughs> That's right. But it was really well said in that I love building platforms, and today we're going to dive into the API gateways within platforms, right? But just bear this in mind. I'm sure many of you, like me, we love solving complicated problems, but sometimes we, we lean into the platform or the tech more than the actual business problem. So a word of caution, uh, Dan, I think, is on point right, with this stuff, coming from the Java space myself and then moving into Kubernetes. Um, I think he's, you know, he made me think. Right? I actually replied and sort of engaged with Dan a little bit. He's, he's super smart. So when I did build platforms, what did I learn? Three key things during my journey, like, say, 10, 15, 20 years. The platforms I enjoyed working with were clearly treated like a product. Heroku had a team behind it, staffing, resourcing, right? I loved Heroku. You cannot have good developer experience without good user experience, right? And this is not UI, I mean user experience, properly thought out. You know, the tools we build as developers day in, day out, and use, you know, for our own thing, we often don't think about the UX. We think about UX for the products we're building, but not for our own internal tools. And this is to our disadvantage. And I think the most value we can have is the workflows and the tooling interoperability. Your day in, day out work is all about workflows, right? Make it work for my workflow. Make it work for my way of doing things. And tooling interoperability, as you saw from the CNCF slide, there's more and more tools out there. How you bring them all together, I think, is really, really important. So with that setup, right, let's dive in more to the API gateway space now and treating an API gateway as a product. Beware of the product versus project mindset. Uh, I believe, particularly if you're a big enough shop, that API gateways need a long-term product owner. There's only a few things I'd say within a platform. I mean, the platform in general should have a product owner, but definitely an API gateway. A lot of the banks have been doing this for years. So I've worked with a number of uh, fintechs, banks, and they have dedicated API teams, API architects, API management teams, whatever you want to call them, but they own the gateway. It's such an important piece of the overall platform that you need people looking after it, feeding it, watering it, caring for it, right? Staff and resource the gateway appropriately, really, really important. And if you want to build an API gateway, it has to be a product. I actually don't recommend building your own API gateway. There's plenty of open source solutions, plenty of things you can buy. Some teams just like to build the gateway, particularly with the rise of Envoy Proxy. People are building stuff on top of it. Um, and I've seen some horrible situations where they've treated the launch of the gateway as a project and then just walked away. And then in a year or two's time, they're migrating off that gateway because no one knows how it works, can't extend it. So you have to treat anything you build uh, as a product in particular. But again, if you can get away with uh, not building an API gateway, that's a winner for me. Take care when lifting and shifting an API gateway. I did a talk uh, go to a couple of years ago on this. Um, I've, every experience I've seen, particularly within Ambassador Labs, when people were moving to the cloud, they just took their gateway and put it in the cloud, it went wrong. Well, to some degree. They ended up re-platforming, as Amazon call it. They, they lift, tinker, and shift. They wanted to just lift and shift the gateway into the cloud, 
didn't work. Every time they had to tweak things, integrate things, took a lot more time than they thought. So do be careful um, of that. When you are doing a migration, it's a cue for reevaluating your requirements. With any product, know your users. Sounds really obvious. Unfortunately, saw it a lot where people did not think about <laughs> who was going to be using the gateway. API gateways do have multiple personas involved. Developers, uh, API folks, operators, business people, that kind of stuff, right? Identify them all and, and understand their requirements. Be very careful. I saw when I was working at Ambassador Labs, a lot of top-down gateways being sold. And they were typically the big APM, uh, so APIM, APIM solutions. Six, seven-figure contracts, very much uh, optimized for the buyer experience. And us as users really struggled with those gateways. They didn't do what we wanted to. They were hard to use. They were golf course software, right? They were sold on the golf course. But then for us, actually using it was really hard. I've also seen similar, though, bottom up. I've seen a lot of companies adopting open source API gateways and not thinking about the business side of it. They're not thinking, how is this gateway observable? They're not thinking about, can I plug an API management solution into this gateway? So think where you're coming from. If you're a developer, you're probably going bottom up, right? You're installing it, playing with it, selling it into the business. If you're going top down as a CTO, you're probably thinking more about business, but you might not be thinking more about how the day in, day out uh, use cases work. User research is invaluable, particularly in a big organization. Again, the banks, right, they literally go and they start uh, playing around and, and, and chatting to folks, watching how people are using the gateways to understand um, uh, what kind of use cases and how people are using the tech. This is really, really important. Um, if you, and this is a great one, right? So I was at QCon New York last week or two weeks ago, uh, and Charity Majors, Charity is amazing. If you haven't seen any of their stuff, like you definitely want to check. I see this a whole lot, right? She said, many platform teams I see operate under the principle of build it and they will come. No, they won't, <laughs> she said, right? So like, I really like that. And that sums it up here, right? In terms of um, don't just build it and think folks will, you know, oh, they'll just use it. Um, really do that research, really understand what problem you are going to be solving with your API gateway. There is no one single problem you're going to be solving with an API gateway. And hat tip to charity, that was a fantastic talk. <laughs> well worth looking at when it comes on InfoQ, well worth checking that one out. Do you understand where the API gateway fits into the biggest solution? The modern cloud native communication stack is complicated. Um, the API gateway is only part of the solution, right? And shameless plug, I did a talk, I think this was online during the pandemic uh, for GoTo. Uh, this is my second or third time at Amsterdam speaking. I, I do love the Amsterdam. Uh, and I think I did a similar talk on the Amsterdam GoTo as well. But if you want to know a bit more about this, check out that talk from a couple of years ago. But I wanted today just to provide a high-level mental model of, of what I see as the typical cloud-native communication stack. Now, I'm going to just sort of imaginary traffic flow here, right? I've got my API gateway. I've coded this one green because mostly API gateways are used by developers, particularly API management kind of solutions, right? There's clearly operations teams. They're controlling things like the CDN, the uh, Content Delivery Network, Akamai, Cloudflare, all that stuff, right? Uh, and that, that's typically, you know, blue there. Operations are controlling the CDN. Service mesh, I've mashed up the colors, because I think service mesh is often controlled by operators and developers these days. So it's the combination of the two. You've got CNI in the mix, container native interface, if you're in Kubernetes land. And you've got software-defined networks in the stack as well, if you're on Amazon or any kind of virtualized environment, sorry, any cloud environment. Now, operations are typically going to be looking at things like CNI and SDN. We may not worry about that, but platform engineers, we're mainly perhaps as developers interested in the top three there, or the left three. But then we start layering on some other things in the mental model. If you're thinking about OSI network model, like layer three, layer one three runs like throughout this stack. You're thinking about IP addresses, you're thinking about ports. On the left, as developers, we're typically higher up in the stack. We're thinking about application level concepts, HTTP, HTTPS, right? Uh, headers, that kind of thing. Uh, so like, I, I do think we as application developers need to focus more on uh, the OSI layer four, uh, so four to seven. Top above here, I'm just sort of some like sort of general things you need to think about when you're implementing the cloud native comm stack. You probably need a web application firewall, right? 
You've probably got some application illities, thinking about authentication, authorization, rate limiting, caching. This is where you know, you're using headers in the HTTP stack. There's some policy, perhaps, in the mix. What users in your app can do. Can they access this service? Can they call this? Same in regard to the workflows. Service mesh is really good at defining, can this, uh, give it, sorry, giving a service an identity and saying, can this service talk to this other service? So you can do network segmentation. There's network access control. There's security groups. Lots more complexity in the mix here, right? And then you layer on the actual use cases, API management, and the IDPs, the internal developer portals on top. Before you know it, right? It's genuinely a lot of stuff. And I mainly put this slide up. It was a useful learning model for me when I was chatting to customers or potential customers at Ambassador Labs helping them understand, like, it's genuinely complicated, right? And you need to think about all the integrations and who's doing what on these things. Uh, and, I, you know, we definitely we can work you through all these things. Like, uh, as an industry, there's fantastic books out there. But do recognize that there is just a lot of integration at the communication stack alone, let alone the rest of the platform, right? So a big decision that comes out of this, is it a sort of an all-for-one or one-for-all solution? You can implement all-in-one solutions. So the solo folks, Isovalent, Kong, uh, cloud vendors. I should, I should give a shout out to the Tetrate folks as well. Matt's in the front row. You would shame me if I don't. I'm going to shout out to Tetrate later on as well, Matt. But there's many uh, folks that are sort of cloud native that will sell you a complete bundle of things here, right? Open source, commercial. Take your pick on that. Um, and it's quite nice, right? Particularly if you're a bigger enterprise, you can just get this thing installed, and then cloud native comms are all in one stack. If something goes wrong, you've got the phone line to call them. They will help you solve it. Any problems? You can also choose best of breed. Shameless plug to some of the technologies I've worked on. Emissary Ingress. There's an Envoy Gateway project coming out. There's Buoyance Linkerd, HashiCorp's console, Istio for service mesh, right? And then there's cloud vendor-specific CNI, and then there's things like Cloudflare and Akamai for your CDNs. So my general recommendation is if you're sort of big enough to care going with a vendor, even if it's an open source solution, it's bundled and it works really nicely. If you're ground up, got no money, but got a lot of engineering resources or engineering cycles, I think best of breed is a good place to start. But again, come and chat to me afterwards if you want to know more of my sort of thoughts on that. But just bear in mind, you, you, there is two, these two options, right? You can buy the bundle or you can unbundle. Moving on, you can't have good developer experience without good user experience. Understand the approach and defaults for your platform. You're plugging in this API gateway. How does your platform currently work? Are you Kubernetes native using CRDs, GitOps? Do you like the CLI? Are you API driven? Or are you UI driven? I've seen that in a lot of organizations. There is no shame in using the UI. Definitely like when I was like a hardcore developer, I loved the terminal and I used to look down on my colleagues that didn't use the terminal, right? And now I've grown up and I'm like, whatever, whatever works for you, right? Whatever works for your team. Um, but just recognize when you're building platforms, um, choose the appropriate solution. Tailor the experience to personas, like a developer experience is going to be different than an operator experience. I think operators in general are more comfortable with the CLI, are more comfortable uh, with looking at dashboards. Developers, you know, like the UIs, particularly uh, enterprise developers, my experience is they do like uh, a good user interface. One of the key things with platform engineering you'll see it time and time again is self-service, the ability to get the work done yourself. But this means many things to many people. And in particular, I had a fantastic podcast last week, which will come out in a couple of weeks' time on InfoQ uh, with Abby Bangza and a few other folks. But Abby works at Sintaso in, in the UK. And she talked a lot about self-service can either mean pull requests, I can create my code, pull request it, or is it business-focused click ops? I can go into a, like even the Amazon portal, right? I'm AWS portal, or I can go into some kind of portal, click around and do the thing I want to. So do recognize that self-service is really important. It's a key enabler with the platform, but there's many forms of self-service. And I lean towards the pull request model, but I do appreciate Abby's, Abby really made me think around some folks just want to um, use the click ops. <clears throat> 
And I did a great talk actually with um, one of Abby's colleagues, um, Paula, the Humanitech folks, Casper, Matthias, or Matthew, sorry. Um, so if you want to know more about self-service and building platforms, shameless plug, this podcast I did a, about a year ago now, which I, I learned a bunch from those folks on, on that podcast around the importance of, of self-service on platforms. As an example, I'm going to use Emissary Ingress to show how we, uh, with a community, many people were involved in this, built out some of the config for our API gateway. Now, if you're used to Kubernetes, this will look familiar, standard kind of customer source stanza. But if you're used to configuring Nginx or Kong or any other like gateway, this will look quite familiar to you, right? There is a quote service, there's a quote prefix. We're mapping the prefix, application slash quote to quote. Nice and simple, right? You can do more fancy things um, with, with the mapping customer source. Um, you can do canary, uh, canarying with like weight 10 there, 10%. Um, you can do uh, rewrites and all these things. So probably quite familiar to folks, right? But imagine developers can write this mapping for their new service. They can change it. They can pull request it. Self-service. Happy days. For ops folks or developers, you know, there's the listener. There's the host. And then there's something like, say, an authentication service. But I would say this initially wasn't the way it was built out. The first versions, the early versions of Emissary Ingress, which were actually called Ambassador API Gateway, mashed together various different concepts. But over the years, we realized with self-service, developers just want to write mappings, want to write routes. And the operators are you know, more interested in setting up ports and setting up authentication. And like, there's local changes you can make to a service, and global changes you can make to your application. Right? So we kind of, the community like gradually moved around like, and sort of with the self-service model, I'll talk about it a bit more in a moment, but split out these various custom resources, enabling self-service, but for the relevant personas. We recognize devs and ops were doing different roles, different cadences with different security requirements, as an example. I'll come back to that in a moment, but now we're going to focus on workflows and tooling interoperability. So workflow and interop, fantastic post uh, by um, Netflix. I mean, we're not all Netflix, right? But I do like to look at what Netflix do. And they talked about full cycle developers and Netflix. Operate what you build. And they had this model where their developers were responsible for soup to nuts, as we say, uh, engineering. So they took the business problems, they built them, they put them in production, they got the feedback, and they kept iterating. But clearly, like Netflix developer couldn't do everything. So they relied on these centralized platforms or tooling teams. And they said the centralized platform team acts as force multipliers by turning their specialized knowledge into reusable building blocks. We can definitely recognize this for the API gateway space, I think. Fantastic um, write-up. And there's a series of talks that Galen Navarro has done on building a PaaS for a bunch of engineers. And he talked a lot about a good deal of the job when building a platform is ultimately about finding the right balances between standardization and autonomy. You want people to like, be able to self-serve and do their own thing, but you don't want chaos right, in your, in your platform. And coming back to my self-service example, I talked about this earlier, but we definitely learned that this was very much the domain on the left of the developer, very much the domain of the operator on the right. But it took us a while to get into that kind of understanding. Again, we used to have like this, uh, I think it was host or camera, what exactly called it, like sort of one object that controlled many things. And developers were modifying it, operators were modifying it, and it just got really messy. And, and I actually got my yeah, developers on the left, operators on the right. Um, and one thing we really dialed into is a lot of operators were doing global changes, right? So they were doing, you know, updating authentication service, enabling TLS, all that kind of stuff. And with that on the workflow, you want to provide more validation. You still want to validate people changing routes and mappings and stuff, right? And rate limiting maybe as a developer, but you really want to check if someone's turning off TLS across the app, is that on purpose? On that workflow, you really want to double down on the validation. So we learned that splitting up not only helped the personas, but you could run different workflow depending on what resource you're committing into your version control. And like I say, this in particular it came up with extra validation when applying global configuration. This is the way, right? The doubling down, I'm, you know, I'm going to change some security profile. Is that right? Get a second you know, peer review extra tests going on, right? This was really a nice thing of splitting the, the, um, the config for the personas. We could split the workflow 
for the personas too. Looking more at interoperability, I wanted to um, do an example. Uh, buddy Jason from um, Jason Morgan from Buoyant, uh, and Itai helped us out. It's a couple of years ago now. We did a um, CNCF webinar, and we wanted to mash up emissary ingress uh, and um, Linkerd. So emissary ingress is an Envoy powered north south API gateway, and Linkerd is an east west uh, custom proxy based um, service mesh. And Jason and I like, were given this task, and we we're like, I wonder how easy it is going to be to integrate these two projects, one for managing our API traffic, one for managing our internal service-to-service -service traffic. Well, we looked, and both use what's called the Kubernetes resource model. So we use custom resources, like I showed you before. We use what's called controllers, the way to kind of like build and extend Kubernetes. We use a whole bunch of the Kubernetes best practices. It actually turned out to be a one-line integration to mash the two projects together. If you're interested, that was the line, right? Um, uh, but once we'd mashed it together, the configuration was very similar across projects. Like the Linkerd um, stanzas for config are very similar to the emissary ones. And they're moving even more similar now, actually, because of the uh, Kubernetes API gateway spec. But we can, I digress. We can chat about that offline if you're interested, interested. But it was really interesting to watch. You know, We built the two projects separately, different communities but we thought about the interoperability with the wider ecosystem, and mashing them together was therefore really quite easy. As a counterexample, and I'm totally going to poke fun at Istio and Nginx. I've used Nginx a whole bunch. I've used Istio quite a bit as well, a little bit as well. Um, and they're both amazing technologies. I feel like I can poke fun of them because they are so well adopted. And I'm going to say, if you are going to use Istio and Nginx, I will shout out Tetrate, Matt, because this, this is a great blog post for how to mash those two technologies together. So Istio for service mesh, east-west, uh, and Nginx for um, ingress, right? But what I thought it was quite funny. It's a great blog post by the Tetrate folks. But this stanza is just a, it's, I think it's about 1% of the actual config required to mash together the two things, right? And it's well researched. I've got to give a hat tip to Tetrate folks. And, and, and there is a lot of advantages for running Istio and Nginx, so I'm not trying to be overly negative. But I just had a little smile because Nginx is battle tested, super widely adopted, but it's pre cloud. Right? And Istio is very much born after the cloud, Envoy-based, um, uses all the good principles. So mashing the two things together requires a lot more work. Right? So just recognize that as a, as a platform operator. Again, I, you know, I have a personal opinions, right? but I'll be careful how I share them. But I just thought this was a really interesting example of the interop challenges. And lastly in this space, I wanted to point out in terms of interoperability, API gateway plugin, plugins, love them and hate them, right? Uh, plugins, extensions, filters, bunch of names for them. They provide reusability. You can have like an authentication plugin. You can have a logging plugin, that kind of thing. You can use it everywhere once you've built it. Clear separation of concerns. The gateway is doing the logging, so your application maybe doesn't have to do quite as much logging. Or the authentication is clearly handled by the gateway, your app assumes everything is authenticated. And you can even get performance improvements. Rather than using, say, like doing something in the Java world, which can be, uh, I mustn't be too negative against Java, because the performance of Java is generally amazing these days. But I've definitely seen some examples where doing some stuff in, in a C plugin in the gateway was more performant than doing it in a standard Java app, as an example, or a standard Ruby app, right? So plugins and extensions, really nice model. We, you know, we live and die by dependencies as software engineers, right? Uh, and these kind of things are, are really valuable. But they are often highly coupled. That's the problem, right? My architect career, you know, high coupling and low cohesion were the dearth of my life, really. Um, and I used to do a lot of consulting in this space, and, and I saw a lot of mistakes being made. People often you know, very strongly coupled their extensions with the API gateway. They often had to. They had to use the API gateway API, right? Um, and they often accidentally coupled their extensions with the system itself. So do recognize, love extensions, love the plugins, but they can provide high coupling. And in particular, bane of my life for a couple of years when I worked at Open Credo, uh, we used to go with uh, um, Zool. Remember, anyone remembers uh, Zool? It was a Netflix uh, gateway, open source gateway, um, was released, and you could inject groovy scripts dynamically into the API gateway to modify behavior at runtime. And it seemed super cool, I'm not going to lie. When I first heard about Zool, I was like, this is pretty cool. But the amount of projects I saw, typically with Spring Stacks and Java Stacks, they brought in the Zool API gateway because, hey, Netflix uses it, right? <laughs> it's got to be good. And they put all these groovy scripts in to dynamically 
update um, behavior. And they'd smeared the business logic in these Groovy scripts as well as the app. And there, every release they were doing, had, they had to coordinate the release of the Groovy scripts into the API gateway and the app itself. Absolute nightmare. Please do not couple um, your business logic or spread your business logic across different environments. Like Netflix were very honest and said, you should not do this. These Groovy scripts are for extending the operational characteristics. But if you can do it, people will do it, <laughs> right? So this is an actual, um, I've seen it way too many times, this is an actual picture of a real life API gateway plugin architecture that I saw several times during my, um, my tenure at Open Credo. Um, a couple of really gnarly examples where people have put some business logic in these groovy scripts, uh, and then another team depended on that particular implementation. Of course, then the other team changed the implementation, broke their script. It was just a complete Rube Goldberg machine of how does this stuff even work? Right? So I've seen it a few times in my career with aspect-oriented programming as well, some of the Ruby magic I've seen it with as well, um, with the dynamic changes. And I've seen it same deal with, with the API gateway plugins. And it's all about coupling. It's all about cohesion. Really do think about those things. So wrapping up, going pretty good to time. Um, I ha people might be thinking, tell me more about my options, right? And I haven't done like specific callouts other than a few gateways because really a lot of the stuff is, is checkbox, right? Like you want certain support for protocols, you want uh, certain capabilities. I've got to shout out the Learn Kates folks. So if you're going uh, choosing an API gateway in the Kubernetes space, uh, even in the cloud space, this is a really good resource. Apologies for the long URL, but I'll share the slides and you can look at it. And you can match your criteria, what you want, against what all the various open source and commercial offerings are out there. Bear in mind the advice I've given you today around you know, treating platform as a product and cohesion coupling, but this is, a, this is my go-to. I actually contributed to it, so hands up on that one. I think many of us in the space did contribute to it. Um, so the Danielli and the Learn Kates folks have done a really good job uh, with this. So in conclusion, Choosing or migrating an API gateway is a type one decision. Please do invest a lot of time, particularly on the migrating phase. I've seen people think, ah, oh, you know, I've already got this gateway, I'll just put it in the cloud. Um, my advice is if you can not do that, just take a beat, check whether your current gateway is meeting your needs, will it be easy to lift into the cloud? Well worth doing that, because it's type one decision, you're gonna be living with it for a while. Tricky to reverse, but the right decision does add a lot of value. That's the key thing, I think, with type one decisions. Do have that clear ownership for the platform and the API gateway. Projects where, as a consultant, I was brought in with OpenCredo as an example, a lot of times was it the technology was treated as a project rather than a product. It was built once, handed off, uh, project complete, done, and it just decayed over time. No one owned it and these kind of things. And then we had to go and like, fix it. So do treat the API gateway of the platform as a product. Clear ownership, really important. And so, yeah, so treating API gateways as a product, I think, is really valuable. Identify the personas. Recognize if you're C-level, you're probably going to be thinking about more about the buying and the operational characteristics. If you're developer, IC, individual contributor, contributor you're going to be thinking more about the day-to-day -day usage. You need to think about both things. How are the business folks going to understand and use it? How are they going to observe it? How developers, operators, QA folks are going to use day in, day out the API gateway? Think about all the things. Integration within that wider cloud-native communication stack is really, really important. Right? I showed you that kind of scary-looking diagram. You know, recognize it for what it is. And when you're choosing what things to plug together, know your options and choose accordingly. Do think about the developer and operator experience. Self-service is the name of the game here, but self-service depends on your organization. Some folks, self-service means pull requests with code. Some folks, uh, for some folks, self-service means user interface, UI-driven. And lastly, focus on the workflows and the tooling interoperability. That's where I think you know I've spent a lot of my time over the years making sure that I've created solutions that adapt to the workflow of the organization I'm working with. And particularly in this cloud native uh, space, there is like a Cambrian explosion of tools out there, um, which is great. It's a sort of sign of a healthy ecosystem. I think we're seeing with the whole uh, macroeconomic climate, I think we're seeing some of that collapsing back in on itself now, particularly in terms of funding. So we are going to see more consolidation, more bundling over the next year or so. But just recognize, choose tools that work well together, is my, my sort of uh, thought on that. Sounds really obvious, but so many times I'm like people, I've seen people doing like duct tape 
glue, straw, crazy things to get you know things working together where like I don't think that was the best solution. Good integrations and appropriate extensions are the key. Like I say, extensions add a lot of value, but in my you know, 10-year career, particularly with working on API gateways, the biggest challenges I saw were around extensions. People putting business logic in them, people highly coupling them. And again, because it's a type one decision, it was really hard to like, unwind some of these decisions in, in folks I was working with. At that point, I shall pause and say uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.